You know, we looking at the story of uh, Melchizedek, we find this in Genesis, and this, of course, is right after uh, Sodom. Uh, of course, Sodom had been attacked, and Lot, uh, Abraham's uh, son-in-law, is actually taken captive, and then Abraham goes in and he pursues those that have taken taken Lot uh, with his uh, with his men. He overtakes them. He goes as far as uh, a little city north of um, Damascus at that time. Kind of interesting thought in itself. But anyway, as after that particular time, of course, in the king of Sodom, he goes out to, to meet Abraham afterwards. But the important thing is we find in Genesis, Bereshit uh, uh, chapter 14, in around verse 18, it says, Then Melchizedek king of Salem and brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God uh, most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, processor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who uh, has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all, and that was uh, Abram or Abraham, Ab, uh, Abraham had not been given the name Abraham at that particular point as of yet. He was still being called Avram, as we would say in Hebrew, or Abram. Uh, now, I'm in fully intention of doing a much deeper study on this, but I posted, uh, by the way, I'm talking to my wife here uh, right now about this. I like to share the revelations with her kind of first before I talk about it on, on, on YouTube. So I haven't got a chance to tell her. I kind of kept her in suspense all day. So, kind of like I did the people on Facebook when I posted the question, who is Melchizedek? Uh, interestingly enough, though, when I posted that on today, I just asked the question. There's somebody, somebody else's comment I've seen on there. They were talking about Melchizedek. And so I thought, well, that's an interesting subject. So I put on my own Facebook page, who is Melchizedek? And I put it in Hebrew, and I also put it in English, and just stirred up a windstorm. Because I did say on there, I said, no, that's a loaded question. Uh, I didn't really explain myself. But the reason why I did it was because this morning, the Lord revealed something to me about Melchizedek that I never saw before. Now, I already knew who he was, but I had not, I'd never been given this revelation before about his identity. And there were several people on Facebook finally that came out. Some were saying, it's Yeshua. And another one said, oh, yep, it's Yeshua. Another one says, well, he's the king of Salem. <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, some really kind of cool answers there. Well, they're right, and yet they're, they're right. So it is Yeshua. It is Jesus. But the question is, though, is how do you prove it? Really, when you go into the depth of this, you're going to find out really who God is. Because that the, Melchizedek, the key of knowing who Melchizedek is, is also a key in God's identity. Because Elohim, the the word that we see used for God in the very beginning, in, in the beginning of Genesis and everything, Elohim is the plural way of saying God. But it is God manifesting himself. That's why we have Elohim. It doesn't mean that we have three gods or four gods or five gods or anything like that or two gods even. It is the fact that God can manifest himself in more than one way. Now this is who Melchizedek is. It's God manifesting himself in another way. Now I'm going to show you what the Lord revealed to me. But before I do, I want to bring out a couple of points. Let's take a look. Uh, one, drop my notes here. But... Um, I just want to take and show you something that's of, of kind of an interest here. Um, if we if we were to look, well, actually, we, let me start off with Hebrews chapter eleven. And this is in, in in the book of Hebrews. This is where, uh, and of course, many people believe that Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, I know there's some debate as far as who actually wrote it, but. Um, not going to get into that. We'll just simply, we'll just kind of hold to the traditional thought that Paul wrote it. Now, we know in chapter 5, 6, and 7, he talks a lot about Melchizedek. Um, and I'm going to get into all of that later because you have to understand when Paul met uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus, Yeshua, an interesting thing happens to him. You know, he's struck down by the bright light. And then he says, you know, Lord, who are you? 
because the light from the light a voice speaks and said Saul Saul why do you persecute me and he said it's hard for you to get kick against the pricks and he said Lord who are you you know now oddly enough Paul would not call anything else I mean this was the pillar of fire this is the same thing that we see when Moses met God on the backside of the desert, it was a pillar of fire. And of course, the scripture says the angel of the Lord appeared unto Moses, but it also says, though, Yahweh spoke out, or Yahweh spoke out from the midst of the fire. So what is the angel of the Lord there? The angel of the Lord represents the way God is, has manifested himself. It's the body in which he manifests himself in, which is the pillar of fire. Um, and so when Paul saw that light, he knows, you know, that's God manifested there. Well, then, of course, Jesus, in the way they translate it in the Bible, says that Jesus says, you know, I'm Jesus, or I'm the Yeshua, I'm, uh, you know. And so it kind of shocked him to know that that's who that was. Now, just quickly, though, in Hebrews 11.10, because I don't want to make this lengthy, I'm going to get into this long, much in much more depth later. Um, uh, chapter 11, verse 8, Hebrews, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. This is when he's first called out of Iran from his father's house. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which, was found, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's a key verse right there in the identity of Melchizedek. See, why is Abraham looking for a city whose builder and maker is God? All right, you have to think about that. One, when he met Melchizedek, for example, Melchizedek was a king. He was the king of Salem. So he is a king. And of course, Salem, you know, is peace. Shalom is, is peace. He's a king of peace. Jesus is what? The prince of peace. And a prince is always the son of the father. So if he's the prince of peace, then the king of peace has to be his father. But we're gonna, this seems a little confusing at first, but just bear with me here on this now. Now, he's also, Melchizedek is what? His, his very name means Melech Tzadik. Melech Tzadik. It is king of righteousness. Okay? Now, if God, if we see that Melchizedek is the king of righteousness, that should give away everything to us right there. That should tell you who Melchizedek really is. And how, I mean, the, the very fact that, that even Abraham, when he goes and says he's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, I mean, this is what Paul tells us here. Now, and, and this is just a quick version of it. I, I really, this is something that is so deep to get into. But let me just show to you the part about the righteousness. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and also you'll find this in Romans 6 chapter 18, but in 2 Corinthians, let me find that for you real quick. Uh, this is, I don't know which way to go on. Here we go, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. I'm going to back up to 20. Now then, we'll, excuse me, back up to verse 19. Uh, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Okay, we know God's in Christ. Just as we see the pillar of fire at the the burning bush is called the angel of the Lord, but yet God was in that pillar of fire speaking to Moses because it says that God spoke from the midst of the fire. So, so God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trans, uh, excuse me, trans, trespasses to them 
and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you in Christ's behalf, he reconciled to, uh, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin, speaking of Yeshua here, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When a king, if, there, if, a, if a person is a king, he has to have a domain. Abraham, there's two key, key points here. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. So who's the builder and maker of the city he's looking for? It's God himself. All right? Now, Melchizedek is a king. He's a king of a city. We know he's a king of Salem, which means he's a king of peace. But his very name, Melchizedek, you know, Melech in Hebrew, Sadiq in, is, you know, the two words there, Melech and Sadiq right there. He's a king of righteousness. His domain, his subjects, his people are the righteous ones. Jesus, Yeshua, became sin that we might become his righteousness. This is why Abraham could not find the city in his day. The subjects had not, they hadn't been born, all of them hadn't been born yet. You understand? I mean, Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. And a king is not a king unless he has a domain. The domain are the people themselves. That's where the word kingdom comes from. It comes from the king and domain. And the domain are the people. And Christ became sin. Basically, what happened? Melchizedek himself was nothing less, nothing more. He was... It was the, if it's the right word to use, it was the theophany of Jesus Christ when he was, before he came to earth, when he was still, you know, we, we hear the story, the song and everything said he was the king and he laid down his crown to become one of us. He became one of us. Why? Because Melchizedek, he meets Abraham, but the problem is he's got to come and do the kinsman redeemer work. He's got to become the kinsman in order to be able to get his kingdom. Because we're the righteous. God just in a couple of chapters before in Genesis promises Abraham, you know, that he's going to have a seed. And he doesn't tell him he's a father of many nations yet, not even when he met Melchizedek. Because after he meets Melchizedek, it's a little bit later after that, that he begins to tell him, your name shall be called not Lo Avram, Aval Avraham. Ata Kala Avraham, you shall be called Abraham, father of nations. So everything is playing out in an order here. You know, one, he meets the king. And of course, in this case here, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a priestly order. And as, as Paul later points out, it's not, it's not uh, you know, because Jesus, Yeshua springs up from the tribe of Judah, which Moses never spoke of, of a priesthood. But he says, yet at the same token, though, Paul speaks how that, but yet here Jesus says he is a priest. He, but he's after what? He quotes the psalm. I believe it's Psalm 110, you know. He's a, after the order of Melchizedek, which is not even an earthly kingdom. It's not an earthly ministry. It's just Abraham meets the king in advance. Kind of like Job in his day when Job, you know, he says that, you know, I was, I, you know, no, what, what was it? The scripture says, uh, I think Jesus says it. He says, uh, was it Abraham? Was that what it was? I forget where it was, where he says he rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and he was glad. Abraham. It's Abraham. That's when he saw his day. He saw it when he met Melchizedek because he met Christ in a glory. In, in, I want to say glorified state, but the glorified state is after the resurrection. So it had to have been in his theophany. He longed to see my... He, and he saw it and he was glad. 
Now that's not where it ends at though. The part about the righteousness is only, I got that revelation afterwards. The, here's where the clincher is. Where's my glasses? Here they are. I ain't on top of my kippa. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is exciting. Keep dropping my notes. Praise God. But anyway, all right, here's where the clincher is. Now, let's look though real fast though. Uh, uh, I want you to go to Hebrews 6, chapter 6. Oh, by the way, just to show you another one too real quick, Romans. In the, in the book of Romans, I show you get on the righteousness now. Romans chapter 6, verse 18. And having been set free from sin, you became... Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, you became... Uh, that's an odd translation. You became slaves of righteousness. Another translation I was looking at earlier was servants of righteousness. Certainly. We become servants of Christ. It's actually the better translation of servant. But, but even so, slave, it doesn't matter. I'd rather be a slave for Christ than anything else. Paul said, I'm a prisoner to Christ. Uh, but that's, here's, here's what I want to bring you to. Though. This, this, is, this, is the, this is what God revealed to me this morning. Now, you go to Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which... Oh, I was actually reading a certain... Just a second ago. By faith, he dwelt in a land of promise in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs of the same promise. He, for he waited for the city which, was, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, that's what I read to you three seconds ago, right? Now, if the city, the builder and city is maker is God, and we know that, you know, he's met the king... Let's take a look then of, of a very interesting point here. Now, Abraham, or Paul says here that Abraham was looking for a city that was made by God. He's looking for an actual city. Why? He's met the king already. You know, and, and no doubt, this is why he, you know, Melchizedek, one, Paul tells us that, that Melchizedek had neither father nor mother, nor beginning of days or ending of life. Now that should settle it right there who he is. The only person that doesn't have a father and a mother is God himself. And it's one reason why, technically speaking, we can't really say that, that Melchizedek is Jesus because Jesus does have a father. He did have a beginning there. But that's the earthly flesh body that is born for the purpose of a sacrifice. That's why Yeshua is called the Prince Sal Shalom, Prince of Peace. Because it's only representation of sacrifice. And I'll get into that later. But, but here's, a, here's a cool thing. We know though, according to the scripture, the, 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 the builder of the city, the builder and maker is God, right? Nobody could argue that. You have to agree with that one. But if you take John chapter 14, this is where, this is the part that God revealed to me this morning. It just came, I didn't even, I wasn't reading it. It just came to my heart when I saw the part about Melchizedek. Because when I was reading it, I saw a little comment somebody made about Melchizedek. And I thought, that's exactly right. I said, you know, I said, Abraham, he looked for a city, you know, whose builder and maker was God. That's the first thing that came to my mind was that scripture there in Hebrews. And then I remembered this famous quotation by Jesus himself, Yeshua. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus goes to make this city. He goes to prepare the place. Now you know who the builder and maker of this city is. Now you know who Jesus is. He is God. Because he said he's going to prepare the place. And even the scripture says, all things that are were made by him. 
Now we're going to get into it a lot deeper in another video. I'm not going to do it right now, but we'll talk together, me and my wife, after I turn this off. It gets better and better all the time. Though. God bless.